In this module, we're going to review the basic definition of the 2D Fourier transform. So the 2D Fourier transform has a similar structure to the 1D Fourier transform. The main difference is that now we have uh, integration over dx and dy. Uh, in this case, we're going to be considering functions of form g of xy, so uh, spatial functions. So we once again take our function. In this case, we multiply it by uh, a complex exponential that's now a function of both x and y. And we have spatial frequencies kx and ky. Uh, the output then is denoted as capital G of kx and ky. And we can also use this notation the Fourier transform of a function g. As with the 1D Fourier transform, it's possible to take the inverse Fourier transform, which in which case we take the Fourier transform g of kx ky. We multiply it by a complex exponential that has the same similar form as the complex function we used here, except now there's no minus sign there. We integrate over dkx, dky, and we get back our original function gx and y. Just as a note, uh, some textbooks, such as Prince and Links, uses u and v instead of kx and ky. So just be important to keep that in mind. Let's take a look, closer look at this complex exponential. Okay, once again, using uh, Euler's formula, we can write this as the sum of a cosine 2 pi kx ky, kxx plus kyy plus j times sine 2 pi times kxx plus kyy. And then let's look at sort of just this cosine term. So if I only have the kx part of it, so then in this case I have cosine 2 pi kxx, this is now just a function varies with x, okay? So it's a function of both x and y, but it only shows variation in the x direction, such that the, um, the period uh, of this cosine is one over kx. But only, it only shows variations in the x direction. On the other hand, let's say, and this is in the case where um, there's no dependence on kx, so this would be common where ky equals zero. Now let's consider where kx equals zero. In this case, I, it boils down to cosine two pi ky times y. So now this only shows variation in the y direction and has a period of one over ky. Now in general, we will have both kx and ky. And so the cosine will show variation in a, in a diagonal direction. And it turns out that the period of this uh, is now 1 over square root of kx squared plus ky squared. This is shown here where, for example, remember we're looking at something of the form cosine 2 pi kxx plus kyy. And so it has a variation. The period is 1 over kx in the x direction and 1 over ky in the, the y direction. And it turns out that then this period here is given by 1 over kx squared plus ky squared. Okay. We'll talk about this later uh, in another module, but an easy way to remember this is if I have both kx and ky as my spatial frequencies, then that gives rise to an overall spatial frequency uh, given by the Pythagorean theorem. Okay. So this is the actually effective spatial frequency when I have both kx and ky components. Let's take a look at examples of some sinusoids um, at varying values. So here we have u naught here is corresponds to our kx, and this would be ky. So let's look here. Here we're varying kx from 1 to 2 to 4, and ky is equal to zero, all right, for all of these. So since ky is equal to zero, there's no variation in the y direction in these uh, sinusoids. And the variation in the x direction increases um, as I increase the spatial frequency. Because remember, this spacing here is one over kx. And so as kx gets larger, higher spatial frequencies correspond to smaller periods. Now in the lower example, I have kx starting at 4, 
and staying at 4. And then what I'm doing is I'm increasing ky from 1 to 2 to 4. So let's take a look at this one. This says I have um, uh, four cycles for some spatial period. Um, so in this case, it looks like it's one, two, three, four cycles per this spatial period. And in this case, and that's in the x direction. And here in the y direction, you notice I only have one period from here to here in the y direction. So I have four times as so much variation in the x direction as I do in the y direction. And that gives rise to um, a diagonal uh, variation. Now in this case here, I've kept the variation in the x direction the same. So there's still four cycles in the x direction. But now I've increased my spatial frequency so that ky equals two. And now you see I have two cycles of variation in the y direction. And so now the diagonal starts tilting. Similarly here, we're staying with four cycles here in the x direction, and now we have one, two, three, four cycles in the y direction as well. And so now this is going to be oriented at a 45 degree angle because I have as many variations um, per unit space in the x direction as I do in the y direction. So when we talk about Fourier transforms, it's very common to use the term k space uh, to refer to the Fourier transform of an image. So k-space is used quite frequently in imaging modalities such as uh, MRI. So this is an image defined, so this would be g of x, y, and we would then refer to its Fourier transform as being represented in k-space. Okay, so this is essentially, we'd say this is the k-space representation of our image. So let's take a look about how we actually get points in k-space. So the idea is for every image, we will actually create, we need to calculate different part points in k-space. And the, the next question we're going to answer is, how do we actually go about that calculation? How do we fill up k-space with the correct numbers given some image g of x, y? We want to, for every value of kx and ky, we want to calculate the correct number to put into this k-space representation. So here's an example where we, um, so this would be kx ky. And so in this case, we're trying to figure out what is the value of the Fourier transform at some value gkx comma zero, because this is along the ky equals zero plane. So we recall that if kx, if ky equals zero, there'll be no variation along the y direction. And so we're looking at sines and cosines that have sort of this type of variation, where there's only variation in the x direction. So we take something like this, some say cosine and sine, and we can imagine multiplying it by our image, and then we integrate over the entire image. And that integral, then we put that number and store it in our uh, correct place in k-space. Similarly, if we're here, we want to figure out the value of some, val of some k space values g of 0 comma ky. And once again, it's zero because now we're along the ky axis and kx equals zero. And re remember, when kx equals zero, that means there's no variation in the x direction. There's only variation in the y direction. And so we're looking at sines and cosine that sort of have this pattern. So we take this pattern, we multiply it by our object, and then we take that multiplication, integrate over all of space, and then take that and plug it in as our k space value. Uh, now, in general, remember, we're dealing with complex exponentials. So instead of sort of these simplistic sort of bars, we're really thinking about dealing with uh, phasers, where the, the alignment of the phasers varies with space. And so you can sort of see here, in this case, kx equals 0, or sorry, ky equals 0. So I only have variation of the phasers in the x direction, and you can sort of see that this is from here to here is, is one period of that phaser. And so, <clears throat> strictly speaking, we're taking our object and actually multiplying by a phaser function like this. And then that integral goes here. Uh, here we have kx equals zero, and so if you look at how these phasers vary, there's no variation of these phasers in the x direction, okay? If I take any row, 
the phasers are pointing in the same direction, and there's only variation in the y direction. In this case, there's one period going from here to here, and so that's the variation that we have. So we take this phasor field and multiply it by our object, we integrate, and we get